William Faulkner said, when talking, uh, he's an American author, he said, the past is never dead, it's not even past. The past is never dead, it's not even past. And uh, the reality is our personal shadows continue to be a part of who we are. An organization can never get past its past. Uh, ethnic groups are influenced by their history. And churches are the same. Our past becomes part of who we are. And so studying church history becomes important because who uh, we are is a result of where we've been. <laughs> who we are is a result of where we've been. And so we need to know where we've been so we don't keep making the same mistakes. And we need to know where we've been so we can do some of the right things that our forefathers have done. One of Job's friends, friends, uh, Bildad said this in uh, Job 8 and verse number 8. Click. Click. Click again. Job 8 and uh, verse number 8. Please inquire of past generations. Please inquire of past generations. It's important for us to inquire of past generations and learn from them. So let's just pray and ask the Lord to, uh, to help us. Father, uh, this uh, is an important thing that we're looking at tonight, and I just ask that you'd help us to get it, to understand it, to receive it. In Jesus' name. Amen. House lights just a little bit higher, please. Um, so let's do a quick review of uh, where we have been, the things we uh, learned from last week, and they should be coming up. Uh, and the first thing we learned as we looked at the first 300 years of church history is the church was an inclusive culture where grace prevailed. The church wasn't some crowd that only certain people were allowed into. The church wasn't a crowd where if you had enough money you could join. Uh, the church wasn't a crowd where you could become a part of it because the color of your skin was right or your gender was right. The church is and must continue to be an inclusive culture and the inclusive culture must be marked by grace. The inclusive culture must be marked by grace. The second thing uh, we picked up is doctrinal and spiritual decisions were not made in isolation. You've been placed into the body of Christ. You've been placed into the church. And the church becomes life to you. It becomes, uh, it becomes wisdom to you. It becomes communion to you. It becomes advice to you. And we don't run around like a bunch of lone rangers deciding what is right and what is wrong. Uh, we don't and aren't allowed to decide and build our own theology, our own convictions about what we want to believe. Uh, the church, right from the Jerusalem Council, Acts chapter 15, decided the stance they were going to take together. It seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit. And the third thing uh, we picked up uh, last week as we looked at the first 300 years of church history is Christians did not retreat from persecution but were willing to die for their faith. Christians did not retreat from persecution but they were willing to die for their faith. Polycarp was the bishop in, uh, in Smyrna in uh, mid, mid second century. A.D. Uh, 165, he was in hiding because people 
were threatening to uh, take his life. He was uh, discovered. He was found. He took a donkey ride into Smyrna. And uh, when he got to, got to Smyrna, he was arrested for being a Christian. So we discovered that last week. It was illegal in the Roman Empire to be a Christian. It was illegal. He was charged with being a Christian. He uh, was brought by guards into the Colosseum and said, uh, uh, we're going to burn you to death. And his response was, let me pray first. And Polycarp began to cry out to God for an hour, and he prayed, he prayed fervently from the depth of his soul. And by the time he'd finished praying, the guard said, we don't want to have anything to do with killing this man. Refused to be a part of it. The higher-ups came in and took over uh, setting the fire. Put Polycarp in the middle and lit the, uh, the boards, the wood, around on fire. And the fire went up like an arch around him. <laughs> and it burned and it burned and it burned. But Polycarp is standing in the middle, and it's not touching them. They get so angry uh, that they come with swords, and they begin to pierce him. And the blood spurts out of him with such force that the blood puts out the fire. <laughs> and he doesn't die uh, from the fire. He dies from... Uh, the loss of blood. But here's the story. The guard said to him, and then the, the higher up said to him, we really don't want to kill you. If you would just take a wee bit of incense, just a wee bit, you don't have to take much. Hear this part, because we compromise. Just take a wee bit of incense, not much, just a wee bit, and offer it to Caesar, and we'll let you go. And he said... I have been alive now for 86 years. I've been a Christian. My Lord has never done me any wrong. I'm not going to deny him now. He died loyal to his faith. Uh, he was loyal to the gospel. The early church and the story of the early church is this group of people who were willing to die for their faith. Of course there were exceptions, but there was this deep commitment to die and willingness to die uh, for their faith. And then we ended last Saturday night with the edict of Milan in 312 AD. The edict of Milan was an agreement between Constantine and uh, Licinius, uh, two emperors in Rome. I'll explain that story in a little bit. Uh, they said that uh, they were going to make all religions legal in the Roman Empire. They weren't really putting their stamp of approval on Christianity. They just said, we will make all religions uh, legal in uh, the Roman Empire. The reason there were two empire emperors here is Diocletian, Emperor Diocletian, uh, said in 286, or appointed in 286, uh, a guy by the name of Maximian uh, to be kind of a co-emperor in the eastern part of the empire. And ever since then, there had been these two emperors. Empire, part of the empire, eastern part of the empire, that... Uh, Christianity was going to be okay, and this season, this three centuries of, of systematic persecution came to an end. So I want to ask the question as we move on from where we ended last week. How did the Edict of Milan work out for the church? How did the Edict of Milan work out for the church? So before the Edict uh, was passed in, uh, in 312 A.D., one out of 10 Roman citizens identified themselves as Christians. A hundred years later, 
almost all of the remaining 90% had, convert, had converted. So we look at that and say, wow, God's in it. Make Christianity legal. Everything is good. Everything is rosy. Everything is wonderful. Uh, it's even better than that. Uh, the emperor Constantine begins to grant all kinds of favors to the church. This sounds wonderful. The government began to pay for you to build your own church building. And some of them were marvelous. And then he said, and church needs people to make sure the work gets done. So we'll put everybody who works in the church on salary. And now there were people in an unholy scramble to try to become employees of the church. Because it was a government job and the government job paid really, really good. Emperor changed the name of the Lord's Day to uh, Sunday, after the Day of the Sun, a heathen festivity. Uh, I want you to think that through a little bit, because some of you refuse to participate in certain days, and I'm not asking you to change that because of their heathen roots, but every, maybe that's why you come to church on Saturday. Sunday. Sunday is actually in worship, the name of it, to a heathen god. But Constantine takes the Lord's Day, changes the name to, to Sunday. So did it work out well? Well, by the end of tonight, we'll kind of hear the rest of the story. But there are a couple of things that, uh, that begin to change. Values and priorities begin to change in the church. And one of them is that the church began to value safety and comfort above taking up their cross daily. The church began to value comfort and safety above taking up their cross daily. I don't know why we have determined that comfort and safety are kingdom, Christian kingdom values. Most of us think being comfortable and safe is God's blessing. <laughs> and we pursue comfort and we pursue safety. But the truth of the matter is it's a value of the kingdom of this world. It's not a value of the kingdom of God. The value of the kingdom of God is we're willing to be persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted. For my name, we're willing to do that. But this culture develops where comfort and safety uh, becomes really important. They'd been being killed for 300 years, and now they could get a government job from the government that we're used to be killing them, and government begins to influence everything, and keeping the government happy became more important than keeping Jesus happy. Culture of pursuit of comfort and safety began to be valued in the church. And the second thing that began to change is there was a gradual shift in emphasis from Christian life to Christian doctrine. So they stopped thinking less about how do we as Christians live, what does Jesus want us to do, and they started having lots and lots of discussions about doctrine. So doctrine, good doctrine, was elevated above lifestyle. So 324 AD, uh, we talked earlier about, just a little bit earlier, about Constant, Constantine and Licinius. Licinius was the leader of the eastern part of the empire. Uh, Licinius in 324 AD, uh, they got into a battle with uh, Western Rome, where Constantine was leading. Now, the interesting part of this is Licinius was Constantine's brother-in-law. Licinius did not follow 
uh, the Christian faith in the Eastern Empire, the way Constantine was following it in the Western uh, half of the empire. And you, you read in Scripture how the Lord is our banner in battle. And when they went to battle, they went at the front of the battle where, showing their banners. And so Constantine has all these Christian banners at the front of the battle. And Licinius in the Eastern Empire has all the banners from uh, the, uh, the false gods, from the gods of the culture. And uh, Constantine defeats Licinius, and uh, now Constantine has absolute control over all of the uh, Roman Empire. And uh, while he's there, he discovers uh, a city called Byzantine, which he took over and decided, I'm going to make this into the new Rome. It was going to be, it reminded me of Saskatoon's roots when I, when I was studying this. Uh, it was going to be a city entirely set apart for God and nothing evil would ever come into the place. And uh, he named it Constantine. Constantinople, and uh, it's now Istanbul. Uh, so now there's two, one emperor, but two capitals, capital in Constantinople and a capital in, in Rome. All of that happening in 324 AD, which is one year between the four, before the fourth major event in church history that I'm going to highlight in this series. And as I said last week, I'm in a lucky position here because I get to decide what the major events are. Um, so here's the fourth major event in church history, uh, the Council of uh, Nicaea. Now there are six other ecumenical councils. If you count the Council of Jerusalem, which we talked about last week, uh, you may say there were eight uh, church councils. But this council takes place in the city of of Nice or Nice, and uh, Constantine is the one who called it. Now this is, the, you should catch that. Who is calling, who's calling the council to figure out what to do about church stuff? The lead of the government, the emperor is calling it. So he calls uh, bishops from all over the Roman Empire. I think it was 318 that came, could have been 314, my memory's slipping me. 314, 318 bishops show up uh, in, uh, in Nice for this uh, council uh, to discuss church doctrine. And this is also interesting. Guess who paid for all the bishops to get there? Constantine. He paid for their travel, he paid for their meals, he provided housing when he gets there. Guess who led uh, the council meeting? Guess who led the council meeting? Constantine. So the emperor is leading all the bishops and helping them make uh, the decision that needs to be made at this council. Uh, so what was... Uh, uh, this council about. It was to deal with doctrine and particularly the doctrine of Arianism. Uh, Arius was a, uh, a bishop from Alexandria and he had come to the conviction that Jesus wasn't God all the time. He was actually created just like you and me. And he was beginning to spread this around the church. Constantine got a hold of that and said... Uh, We've got a problem here. How do you solve a problem? You call a meeting. And so they called a meeting uh, to define and make a clear doctrinal creed. And so out of uh, the Council of Nicaea, uh, we get a creed that is still followed uh, in the church today. And so here is the creed that came out of uh, the council. Uh, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. Now let's stop there just for a second. There is a clear affirmation here that Jesus is God. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus was not made, and through him all things were made. Uh, So they dealt with the doctrine of Arianism. Next slide. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And uh, so now we've got a clear, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. So we've got a clear Trinitarian statement by the church. And we've got a clear statement that Jesus is God. And then they add at the end, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. There's only one church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So the church proposes this creed at the Council of Nicaea. And the 314 bishops, whatever it was, 318, I guess 314... Uh, they vote, and five of them vote against it. Guess what happens to the five? They get excommunicated. If you're not going to believe the right stuff, you can't have any part of us. Uh, They get uh, kicked out of the church. Um, Interestingly, so what did I say is beginning to happen? Doctrine is becoming more important than Christian life. So who leads, who led, who led this council? Constantine, good. That's, this is in 325 AD. You know what Constantine does in 326? His son's name is Crispus. He kills him. He was tired of him. His, uh, his wife's name uh, was Fasta. He kills her. Tired of her, too. But good doctrine sure mattered. Got the doctrine right. And so there's this elevation of doctrine in the church. And lifestyle, Christian life, becomes less and less uh, important. So they've got the creed established. They've decided what they believe, but their uh, and their leader is forgetting uh, that Christian life matters too. So there are two significant events that come up uh, in the fifth century. The first one is the Western Empire, Rome falls apart, and that's kind of uh, interesting. In and. Uh, in and of itself, most, uh, most of the empires in history go through a big battle and somebody comes in, another nation comes in and conquers. Uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, the Western Empire of Rome simply uh, falls apart and uh, a member of the Germanic tribe, Syri, isn't that interesting? member of the Germanic tribe Siri, uh, his name was Odovacar, comes in and uh, just simply walks into the room and, uh, and takes over the empire from, uh, I think his name was Romanus, a 16-year-old empire who had just been appointed empire, uh, emperor by his dad. Uh, so just this peaceful kind of takeover of, uh, of the uh, Western empire. And then the other thing that happens in the fifth century is the establishment of the Pentarchy. Now I'm beginning to lose you if I haven't yet. So what what is the Pentarchy? Uh, The church made a decision that the church would be led by a group of five kind of archbishops. 
And those archbishops were spread over the Roman Empire. I think a map will help us here. There was an archbishop, look for the blue starry things. I did that by myself. Uh, one of them in Rome and one in Constantinople. So those were the two capitals. And then uh, one in Antioch and one in Jerusalem and one in Alexandria. So the church really at this point in history is being led by a group of five, the Pentarchy. The Pentarchy is leading uh, and consulting and making decisions uh, in the Roman Empire. Now they have made uh, over time a little bit of an adjustment and they've decided that the, the Archbishop from Rome is the most important one and uh, the one in Constantinople is kind of important too and the others are important but not as important. But in the seventh century Muhammad dies and the Muslims after Muhammad's death gets re get really, uh, they would call it evangelistic. They begin to spread the good news of the Muslim faith. And really they take over that kind of uh, bottom corner on the uh, eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea. And the church almost becomes non-existent in Antioch and Jerusalem and Alexandria as a result. They're strongly under the influence of of the Muslims. So we're really down to two of the five Pentarchy. So we got uh, one in Rome and one in Constantinople. So all of that happens in the seventh century, which leads me to the next uh, major event uh, in uh, church history. And that is in 1054, the Great Chisholm the great Chisholm. Chisholm. Monday coming, two days from now, uh, this event took place uh, 964 years ago on July 16th. And it really, it happened in uh, Constantinople. Uh, Cardinal Humbert was sent there by Pope Leo IX and Cardinal Humbert walked into uh, the cathedral, the beautiful cathedral in Constantinople, and uh, approached Michael C. C. Rullius and said, hey, um, I got something for you from the Pope, and handed him a parchment, and he was excommunicated from the church. So the leader of the Eastern Empire, so there's now Eastern Empire and Western Empire, the leader of the church in Constantinople is kicked out. And he thinks about that for a week and he sends a letter back to the Pope in Rome and says, you're kicked out too. So uh, both the leaders, part of the Pentarchy, are kicked out of the church and they're the only two that exist anymore. And uh, all of a sudden, the church looks a whole lot different. And back to the Nicene, Nicene Creed, we believe in one holy apostolic church. All of a sudden, the holy apostolic church has two churches. And one of them is the Eastern Orthodox Church. And the other is the Roman Catholic Church the great Chisholm. Now here's the interesting part of this. If you, if you read history and, and you ask the Eastern Orthodox people what happened, they, they say, well, the Roman Catholics left the true church. You ask the Roman Catholics what happened, they say, well, those Eastern Orthodox, they left the true church. Uh, whatever way you look at it, the one holy apostolic church in 1054 became two churches. You ask, when did the Roman Catholic Church start? The answer is 1054 AD. You ask, when did the Eastern Orthodox Church start? The real answer is 1054 AD. Until then, there was one holy apostolic church. 1054 AD, 
uh, there's this great chism that comes into the church. Uh, what was happening here? What, what was the difference? Well, there was this Eastern Western Empire thing going on, but let's do a, and this, is, this list could, could be a whole lot longer, but I'm trying not to be too long when I speak on these subjects because I know they're hard to listen to. But the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, said the Holy Spirit proceeds from Father alone. Holy, and the Roman Catholic Church says Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and Son. So the Roman Catholic Church had accepted the, uh, the Nicene Creed. Um, the Eastern Orthodox had problems with that. Now, just a, a little comment here. Obviously, some people think that's really, really important. My instinct is it's more important for God to keep his church together than for us to think we're silly enough to have be able to figure him out completely. I think one of the most shocking things to most of us when we stand before the Lord in eternity is going to be how poor some of our theology has been. And we would have died for it. So, the Holy Spirit come from the Father or from the Father and Son. Uh, they differed on that. Now, of course, this is a bit of a problem. The Eastern Orthodox Church spoke Greek and the Roman Catholic Church spoke Latin. Communication becomes a bit challenging. Uh, third uh, difference, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, oh, I got that backward, backwards, have to fix it for the morning, headquarters in Constantinople, the Roman Catholic Church headquarters in Rome. Uh, Next, uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, oh, I've, both of these are backwards too. Icons honored in the Eastern Orthodox Church, icons rejected in the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, priests could marry family, could marry and have family, and priests were celibate. So they were significantly different and now we've got two churches that are going, have a little different theology, and they're going uh, in completely different directions. There's a challenge here for us. The Lord only has one church. The Lord only has one church. And this chism, this breaking up of the church, had to grieve the heart of the Father. Perhaps the biggest reason, perhaps the biggest reason the church went in two different directions was a problem that a lot of us have with have. We want to be in control. We want to be in control. And so I'm going to give a little pastoral advice now. Can you receive that from me? We're only safe in leadership. We're only safe leaders when we no longer have to have our own way. When you have to get it done your way, you're still dangerous in the kingdom. Power and struggle for power hurts the church. And so we got an emperor from the east and an emperor from the west, and they kick each other out of the church. And all that happens from that is we got two churches. Well, let me wrap up. Um, some quick take homes from the 4th to 11th century in church history. Organizational and spiritual drift happens subtly and slowly. Nobody thought at the beginning of the fourth century that by the middle of the 11th century we'll have a split church. Nobody thought that would happen. Organizational and spiritual drift happened subtly and slowly. And the church drifted 
and they forgot the things the Lord had taught them. They forgot the Lord's Prayer that uh, John chapter, whatever it is, 15, 19, somewhere in there. It's in the Bible. Um, <laughs> that they may be one, even as we are one. They forgot all that stuff, and they drifted. It's easy for us to drift, too. It's easy for us to drift, too. It's easy for us to get to the place where we so highly value comfort and safety and lots of extra money flowing into our house that we make decisions to make sure that is happening instead of God being honored. And it starts with little things. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And suddenly we find ourselves uh, really at drift. The church drifted. It happened subtly. It happened slowly. <laughs> but it happened. The church drifted. The second thing, uh, we must remember our roots. Do you remember the Council of Jerusalem that we talked about last week? <laughs> and the church is getting all upset because these nasty Gentiles are coming into the church. And you know what? They eat pork. <laughs> No, they they eat pork. <laughs> and some of their men aren't circumcised. How can you be a good Christian and not be... So they deal with all of that in Acts chapter 15. And they, and they come to a conclusion that we need to be an inclusive group. That, and, and they set the standards clearly, but this inclusive group that everybody doesn't have to do everything exactly the same to be part of us. And friends, one of the biggest signs of maturity in our lives, and one of the biggest signs of maturity in, our, in a church is the ability to love people and embrace people who see some things a little differently than we do. And we have to remember our roots. And uh, we have to remember some of the things the early church tried to, to teach us. Augustine. Actually, probably more properly pronounced Augustine. But Augustine said... Uh, something that uh, I think is important. In essentials, unity. There are some things that are essential. We need to believe that Jesus is God. We need to believe in the importance of repentance. We need to believe that God is almighty and sovereign. There are some things that are essential. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. Give each other some slack because I guarantee you that when I stand before God, uh, he, and it probably won't be the first thing on his list, but at some point he'll say, Trisner, your theology stunk. Not in every area, but I'm pretty confident there's some things I think I've figured out that I haven't. So give some people some slack. And uh, remember, remember our roots. Doctrine matters. Of course it matters. Because what we believe eventually affects how we live. But living a life that is sold out for God... Living a life that is sold out for God is far more important than being able to get 100% on a theological exam. Living a life that is sold out for God is far more important than being able to get 100% on a theological exam. I'm getting to meddling. Let me take you back to how I ended last Sunday, last Saturday. 
story of John the Beloved, John the Apostle. John, the guy who wrote the Gospel of John, wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And uh, this is uh, the end of his story. He's let off the Isle of Patmos, returns to the area of Ephesus where he'd done so much of his ministering. He got so weak he couldn't get to church. You remember the story if you were here last Saturday. And guys went and picked him up and brought him to church every, every Lord's Day. And they'd carry him in because he was too weak to walk to church. Three or four guys would pick up this old guy who's over 100 years of age. They'd carry him in, and he had his favorite place to sit in church. This is Rowena's chair. He had his chair, too. He had this place that was his chair, and they'd carry him to his chair. But while he's making his way into, the, into his seat, the place where he sits, and the man are carrying him. He looked at everybody and said, Beloved, love one another. Beloved, love one another. Beloved, love one another. And we fight and we argue. We excommunicate people because, not from the church, just our circle of fellowship. Because they don't believe the right things. They don't do things the way we want them done. And we do ourselves well to remember worship band coming place. The words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. And let me read it to you. Ephesians 4. Verse 1 and verse 3. Nothing comes up when we click there. I would therefore, brethren, that you walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. So he says, walk worthy of me. And then he describes what walking worthy looks like in verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. When you're walking worthy of Jesus, you're worried about the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And when you become a person who's power hungry and has to be under control and you, you, you're really, really living a life of the flesh instead of the Spirit, you'll fight about all kinds of things where Jesus would be happier if you would just say, let's do it your way. Let's stand together.